Hi everyone, my name is Apollo. Uh, this is a follow-up video to a three-parter uh, Lambda Angular Mongo stack that I've done. Um, so um, I wanted to sort of do a proof of concept of serverless applications. So I started with just a very simple, not a hello world, but a to-do um, application. And it's just very basic, right? A lot of this uh, stuff that you'll see, you know, forms the basic uh, basic functionality of your application. This is web-based. You could create a mobile-based application that does similar things, but essentially you have a login page. When you have a to-do app, you want to access your data as yourself and pull in uh, data uh, based on things that you've entered. So um, a basic application is going to have a um, some authentication and authorization. So I go here and log in, and uh, it'll bring you to a list of the to-do items that you've created in the past. Um, so the very first thing, obviously, you're going to do is create a to-do item. So let's do um, demo test 2000. Hit create. The other thing is obviously list the to-do items, which we've sort of done here. Uh, and then you can also edit uh, your items, load or get that one individual item, uh, load it, and then make some modification to it, um, and hit save. And hopefully it saves in the system and you get the updated uh, item in the list. And then you can also go in and delete an item. So if I click delete here, it should delete the item uh, and then return the remaining thing. So this is a very basic function, but there's not too many other, you know, most basic apps are going to do this. There's, it's a basic CRUD in search. Create an object, update it, delete it, list it, and search for it. And obviously you have to have some sort of um, user context uh, and you have the authentication and authorization. Uh, so what I did was uh, create some structure here uh, within AWS, use some components in it, uh, created some code for Lambda and Angular. Uh, so this is, uh, the, the code I created is out there. It's uh, under Apollo Rocks under Bitbucket to do AWS Lambda. So a lot of the stuff I'm referencing code-wise you can find the configuration is a little bit of a, of a setup. Um, but download that and you can play with it. You can play, you can uh, run, you should be able to run the code locally uh, in the Angular app um, using ng-serve. And then let's see, da -da 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 -da. will that work? Will that work? I think if you're running Lambda, it may not exactly work that way. So let's skip that for now. I'm going to edit that part of it, obviously. But let's view the architecture a little bit. So here's the architecture. Um, it's all AWS except for the Mongo piece um, because Mongo is a little bit, it's free and it's easier to sort of interact with. I'm a little bit more familiar with it. Not that much more familiar, but um, I have a ready knowledge of that. So let's look at the architecture. We have Route 53, which is going to direct uh, my website uh, or route calls to my website via this, which points to an S3 bucket that hosts my uh, to-do application. It's going to serve up the static files that are going to be built uh, and then deployed to this uh, bucket under this uh, folder. And then it's the web browser is going to receive my client um, packages or modules and run that client on the web browser. And that Angular client is going to call uh, a gateway API, uh, which is going to um, map to a resource method, uh, which is going to get mapped to a Lambda function. So uh, Angular client calls a web API resource method, and it, that calls a Lambda function, uh, which is going to call a MongoDB 
or call APIs against a MongoDB uh, to get data, to update, to delete, to list. Uh, some of the other things that sort of in here is Cognito, which is a sort of it's a user pool uh, where users can sort of add where the you can programmatically add uh, user new users authenticate um, against that particular uh, framework and also authorize you can secure your uh, gateway methods using Cognito and I'll sort of show how that's done uh, and then for this I just did traditional rest where every you know uh, you have a resource like to do items and you do get um, methods or method calls, HTTP method calls, post, delete, uh, put, and then what I did was I created a lambda function for each one. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to follow that pattern. You probably, for standard uh, interfaces, you probably want separate uh, methods to operate against your uh, resource that you're sort of managing to do items, user items, um, schedule items, etc. You probably want that, but to map it one to one to uh, a lambda, you don't necessarily have to do that. But it's a strategy for a small app. I think it's okay to do this uh, for bigger apps that have a lot more resources uh, and a lot of different business objects. You have to rethink how you know, how many of these standards you want to put out there and manage, and what's the best way to do that. Um, let's see, so some of the other lambdas in here are uh, the sign-in lambdas, and the, uh, the sign-in just lets you either register or log in with existing uh, credentials and, and get some sort of token back. Uh, the to-do pre-sign up is more of, it's a trigger when um, the sign in Lambda calls Cognito and says, hey, I have this new user, sign him up. This trigger just does an auto confirm on that particular uh, user. So you don't have, there's not a manual step that someone has to go through and check off a box to say, hey, this, this user is valid. For this one, that's okay. For other, or for this demo, it's okay to have an automatic confirm just to sort of keep things Flowing. Maybe for other apps too, you just want people to sign up and keep track of who they are and you know the user contacts and sort of uh, help out uh, manage their user preferences. But this is architecture, um, Route 53 to an S3 bucket that's uh, request are sort of mapped to that. Angular client uh, that S3 serves up, runs on the browser gets uh, invokes your gateway API uh, which invokes lambda function which invokes uh, some functionality against MongoDB Cognito Azure authentication authorization secures uh, most of your lambda uh, so it's pretty straightforward it the architecture uh, there's some implementation and configuration setup that you have to do So the backbone of your application uh, is going to be your compute or your active components. And those are um, a lot of the work that you need done is going to be done on the Lambda side, which you know has your get, add, delete, update. Uh, so those are the more active and probably the more important pieces. The GUI um, can be Angular, it could be React, it could be you know Ionic for if you want to run mobile apps, it could be Unity, it could be Xcode uh, that runs on mobile, it could, uh, it could even, be, even be Java for Android systems. But the mo more important things, I think, is happening in the back end uh, and how that gets mapped. You know, how uh, HTTP calls get mapped to it is important, but this is the ones that are actually the units, the components that are actually doing work. So let's take a look at how we set that up. Uh, so if you go to services and uh, click on, let's see, Lambda, uh, you'll get your list of Lambda functions. And there's other, have other tutorials out there that uh, sort, of, sort of show you how to do that. But uh, we'll take a look at the to-do, let's see, to-do get. 
uh, that's the individual item. Let's see. Let's take a look at to do get items. So it's a typical Lambda function. Um, it's Node.js. Is um, if you download the um, the source code, it's running. It, it's JavaScript. Uh, app handler. Um, if you have an app.js as your primary entry into um, your code, you want to set this to app handler. But it's sort of generic. I, it's, I made it a little bit generic so you can reuse the same uh, archive zip file module to uh, run against uh, multiple lambdas. Uh, and what I did was, this is generic code, the app.js code. I went and imported other functions uh, from other files. So I've got a bunch of handlers add to do JS, delete to do JS, get to do. Uh, but this app.js is primarily routing requests uh, from um, the API gateways to these other uh, functions. This is pretty straightforward here. We're doing, um, it's going to look at the action uh, environment variable uh, to know which of these hand, real handler classes to call. So if you look at the handler classes, if you've done Lambda before, it, this is very similar. It does modules, exports. You've got the event, context, callback, uh, and we've got several of these. And this is for this method of publishing things, is just to make it easy to have one archive file instead of trying to create multiple archive files that go to uh, multiple lambdas. It's just one archive file. And just we configure each lambda to um, to change their direct or path in the code. So here's the action. Any cost of this lambda direct, you know, it's it's a list to do. So uh, this lambda is going to, uh, or this app.js code is going to look at the action variable and says, oh, I've got this route map. This list to do goes against the get to do list uh, function which is defined over here and it just does the get to do list so um, <clears throat> create I did create a bunch of lambda functions but I've sort of made the deployment a little bit easier um, so you have to do add to do delete etc so this is uh, one to one matching with my resource um, which is a to do resource that maps to get post, update, delete, etc. But let's take a look at the code real quick and we'll look at the API gateway um, mapping and creation. Uh, so let's see, here's the Lambda, just uh, uh, for the sake of uh, just the deployment, just how to get it out there. If you look at package JSON, there is um, the zip archive or the zip it uh, script. So you zip up uh, into archive.zip, everything in node modules and everything in handlers. So those were the six or seven different files that I um, showed in the Lambda function configuration there. Uh, and then you're also zipping up app.js. I don't think you need this package JSON, but I put it in there anyway. You I'm gonna say you don't need it. Uh, and then this will just create an archive. So we can find where is my finder? Let's take a look at where are these files? Good question. <laughs> is it under documents development under AW, uh, under AWS? Got it. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, it's going to create this archive zip file in order to deploy or to package up all the source file that I need to um, put into Lambda. Now you can manually go in here and um, you can manually go in here and um, select a zip file to upload, but that is not probably the most efficient way to upload your source code, especially if you've got five or six different um, Lambdas to upload. So AWS, uh, the command line interface, has a better way to sort of uh, fix that or 
make that a bit more efficient. So I have this published um, bash script that I run. So I run the npm run zip it, which packages up all of my source file into a zip into a zip file. And then you can call AWS Lambda, and then it just says update code, the, give it the function name that you created in um, in the AWS console, and zip uh, and tell it what zip file to upload, which it has to follow this file B archive zip format. So. Um, once you've initially created your Lambda, uh, and if you do it manually, uh, hopefully you only have to do it once, but you could probably use some other framework in order to, um, to create the different components in AWS a little bit more easily. Terraform will give you that capability, and I'll do another video on how to sort of, you know, initially create your um, infrastructure, quote unquote, within AWS. And then there's probably a better way to deploy this. Code deploy in AWS could probably solve this a little bit better, but you know, deployment of code is probably as simple as this if you're just running it by yourself. You, if you want it to be automated, obviously you want to use uh, code deploy in order to uh, make that better. But it's a one-man show kind of deal. But once you start getting into bigger teams, you definitely want to um, you definitely want to utilize uh, take advantage of what's out there. All right, so I got all my Lambda function. All that um, code can go up there pretty quickly and pretty easily. Uh, so again, it's just for this strategy of how to sort of um, use one library, one module to service your uh, application, uh, I use this environmental variable to sort of help direct um, the code that handles the request. All right, so um, that is the lambda part of this. We've got um, we got you know four, five, six different lambdas that does uh, sign up, CRUD, and some uh, registration functionality. A little bit about the code. The code is pretty straightforward. Um, as I said before. App.js just goes in and uh, checks the environment variable. It does this. Um, it does this update event loop ignore. Now I've talked about this previously, but it just makes sure that the lambda doesn't get hung. Um, in the um, AWS version of this, it's going to. Um, it's going to invoke this callback waits for empty event loop equals to false. So set your environment variable to that so it doesn't hang and get, gives you an error uh, because of this issue, this messaging issue. Um, but once you, here we create a route map that says, hey, if the action is uh, a particular uh, string, then uh, return this, you know, map it to this particular function. So this get to do list is pretty straightforward. MongoDB it's uh, this is what lambda functions look like um, if you sort of create one out of the box you got a connection string collection name um, and this one has some fancy stuff going on it looks just looks at the query string and um, all it does is if there uh, if there's an ID then it's if there's an ID in the query string parameter uh, then it is um, going to get the individual item, which is going to be a different data that's returned. Uh, otherwise, it's just for now. It's not user. It's not user cont uh, contextual, so it's not user specific data. It's just getting everything. So anybody who signs up and puts into the items, it's going to get it. That can be easily fixable. Um, you can look at the context and see who the user. Is invoking, and I, I don't know how to. I don't remember, or I haven't connected um, the context to. You can get the um, what is it called? The authentication um, parameter of the request, and use that to sort of identify who the user is. Uh, the Cognito API gateway setup might already do that, but I don't know that piece of it yet. 
Uh, but so you go in here and you um, check to see if the ID is not null. If it is not null, then you uh, return the individual item. Uh, otherwise, you're going to connect to Mongo when you your uh, when the connection is complete, it's going to go in and sort of uh, cr create this query. And this is where you could sort of make it user specific. But for now, it just returns everything. And it processes through each uh, item and adds it to this document uh, collection. Um, da -da 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 -da. Somewhere we define a documents. There we go, a documents collection there. And then um, we just push the document to uh, the documents collection. Um, and then we, this is what's called uh, every time we, uh, or every time the API or the Mongo library gets a document, it calls this method. And we just keep adding the documents until we get a null. And that signals to the code that we're done getting documents or there's no more documents. And then we send documents and we do this call back. Uh, and then this one is, there's probably a better way to do this within the context of the API gateway and the mapping from Lambda to the gateway response. But here we do this access control allow origin because we're calling um, this API from leapingbots.com slash to do. So it's a, a cross script call to uh, our API. So. I don't want to do this work here, but I know this works. Uh, it can probably be done elsewhere, but I need to do this in order to uh, make the calls from Angular uh, client from leavingbots.com work. So that's a little bit of the code. Uh, and um, a lot of the code is very similar. We're doing insert for add. Uh, and don't, yeah, we're just returning error messages. We're not returning the actual object. The to, the to delete, the delete. Does this delete one, uh, and then the individual get to do it? Does this find one, and then returns? Actually, it still returns it as collection, I believe. Body that otherwise body is items. Yep, there's a new record, and it's not really a new record, but it's a existing record. Uh, and then update to do is going to do a similar thing. Find the uh, find the to-do record using the ID and set that item, this to-do object to whatever that's mapped to, or whatever that ID sort of finds. Da -da -da -da. All right, so that's a little bit of how the Lambda is set up and the code behind it and just an easy poor man's version of, of a deploy. You just zip it, run AWS Lambda update function and it's deployed out to Lambda. All right, so the next component of this is we have a Lambda function. It could be invoked from, um, from, a, from Java, and you could call a Lambda function directly. But um, for you know the behavior of that is sometimes a little bit flaky, depending on what sort of ecosystem you are. I found in Unity 3D, I had some issues with a Lambda uh, invoking any AWS library directly because it was you know, doing some linking sort of translation thing. I don't even remember, but I found like exposing your functionality via web, uh, via web API or REST service as REST services is a lot more reliable and you know, that communication is a, a lot easier. So um, you set up your uh, web API, uh, your REST services using this API gateway and um, you can create an API that has a bunch of resources. Uh, and this particular to-do API has got uh, this authenticate resource, which manages login and registration. It's really just um, one thing that it does, which uh, it does this post. And um, it does this method request. And it does this uh, Lambda integration, which calls this Lambda to-do sign up. And then this is sort of default stuff here. But it goes through and uh, just returns the response pretty much as is from whatever is returned in that context call. Um, or not context, but the response call from, from Lambda. Uh, and then I've set up this other resource called to do items. And um, you've got this get 
which can, um, I've sort of changed this up a little bit uh, from other requests I have. This, this post, let me go back to authenticate. This, just, this is just a straight pass through. If you look at the inter integration request, you got a Lambda function um, that this is sort of how it comes out of the box. The, select the region that your Lambda resides and you give it the Lambda. But for the to do items get, I have to do some other fancy stuff like the, the cross site reference I had to do. And I did, um, what did we do? I did this use Lambda proxy integration, which behaves a little bit differently. Things are not passed through as well. Um, and uh, you can sort of access the the query um, string that um, that is made or that um, comes from the URL from the request that's made from the client. Uh, so it's a little bit different. I think the lead is sort of similar too. I did Lambda proxy, same thing with did I do that with post? I don't remember. So this one's straight through because nothing fancy going on there. Uh, and same thing with um, with the put. So um, it's a pretty easy setup to sort of direct your um, your API resource method to map to your get items. Let's see what else is special about this. Um, I can secure um, the uh, these methods that are on my resource for my API using uh, AWS Cognito uh, and that's just a user pool that has authentication that you can apply authorization to uh, but in order to do that you have to set up these authorizers obviously you have to create your Cognito user pool but you have these authorizers and you can add Cognito as an authorizer for uh, your to-do API. And then once you've sort of hooked up your, um, created your resource and your methods on that resource, you can go in here and uh, select uh, Cognito as one of your authorizers. And the authorizer just means that um, don't let anybody access uh, so let everybody access this method on your resource unless they're authenticated against whatever is doing your authorization. In this case, it's Cognito. Now, just like Authenticate doesn't have an author authorization, um, an authorizer, because this is how you're logging in. You know, people who are not logged in has to be able to log in. So you can't secure, you shouldn't secure this particular method on this resource that does authentication. But this returns a um, a security token that you use to um, in your request to your other methods you pass in the authorization header and you can set that up can I set it up here yes so my token source um, in the request should pass in the authorization um, header in that particular HTTP request, in the header of the HTTP request. So that's how you set up your API gateway. Um, it's There's probably an, um, a Terraform um, way to set all this up, so you don't have to do it manually. But if it's a small enough application, you can set this up manually initially. And then you take these actions. You have to deploy these APIs. Uh, and then those are how you access um, the um, these methods via uh, HTTP. So you create a prod stage, and then these are all of your methods, and this is the URL to get to uh, those particular methods. Obviously, you have to set your HTTP to the right method call. Um, but that's how it's set up. Pretty straightforward. All right, so I just wanted to review where we are. So we talked a little bit about how to initially create your um, Lambda functions and how you can deploy uh, Lambda to, um, to AWS using the AWS command line interface. 
uh, and then I showed a little bit of the source code to access the MongoDB stuff. Uh, and then I also showed how to set up your to do API gateway with Cognito uh, in order to uh, route the, the request, create an API with resources and methods, and how to route those into your Lambda functions. Uh, next, let's take a look at Cognito real quick. I think if you've done it before, it's pretty straightforward. But Cognito, if you go in and let me go here and do, oh, this is Cognito. So if you go to AWS and go to services and type in Cognito, you'll get that. And then you can create uh, your user pool. And if you look at some other videos that I've done uh, on how to create a Cognito user pool. It's pretty pretty straightforward. To do user pool, um, it's got this information. Once you've set it all up, you can assign this particular authorizer uh, in your, where is it? API Gateway uh, API. And then um, tell your methods to use where are we at? Not that one, the resources. Uh, tell your methods to use your Cognito user pool uh, as an authorizer for that method. So that will sort of secure your API functions or your API methods. All right, so that's Cognito. All right, so what you have is a Where's the starting point? Is it main TS? I believe it's main TS. Um, you've got an app module um, that it resides in here. It's going to be bootstrapped. What's bootstrap? Da, 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 da. Yep, the app mo module is, or the app component uh, is bootstrapped within app module. So app component, um, here's the HTML for it. You've got some, uh, do I have navigation? Yep, you've got some router, uh, some routing going on. We created these router links. Uh, and if you look at the app module, it's going to pull in everything it needs. You got a login page to do page component, login service to do service to do create component. Uh, and here we're going to declare app components. These are my different components that I've created. And Angular will understand sort of the, um, what is it called? The, 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 is it Descriptor? Let's see what it's called. Go to my components, login page, and in the declaration, it's, it's called the selector. So when it runs into this app login page in the HTML, it sort of knows what component to create uh, when it sees that. You won't see it here, but this is setting up sort of the router stuff. The router outlet says I'm going to render um, these components that um, sort of link back to this particular declaration, this router link. So this first one has home create login and on our application, right, it has home create login. These are all router links. Uh, when you click on that, it's going to display the content of um, well, let's see, router link, create, active. The app module sort of knows where that, that router stuff is defined. So this app routes, right, when it sees, where is it? I need my HTML here. When it sees this route, slash do this, slash create, slash login, um, this route map for these routes say slash to do list invoke this component slash login um, render this component create render that component so um, and then render it inside of this guy so router link is just a way to specify a path and then angular figures out which component is appropriate or is the right component to create for that particular path. All right, so what I want to go over here is, let's take a look at the login page. 
login page component, um, doing some fancy stuff on init. If it's not authenticated, set the login to true. If it's authenticated, oh, check to see if it's authenticated. So I created this login service to sort of manage whether the user is logged in or not. And then if we need to log in, go in and uh, you know provide a login functionality. So this will do one the user. Let's take a look at the HTML page. Da, 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 da. We got username. We're using I incorporated Bootstrap in here. I'm not going to go over that too much. Um, but the main thing is just trying to get this architecture um, sort of in place. But when you click the button uh, login, then it's going to call this on login function uh, for the component. And on login just calls a service. And this service was uh, injected into this component using sort of this expression declare private login service is going to uh, if you reference this login service it's going to have this instance of the login service um, and then once um, so when we log in we call the service login give it the user password and user user whoa haha -ha, that's a bug this should be username and user password so Good catch. <laughs> um, so I've been doing Apollo, Apollo 1, 2, 3. So it's all been Apollo 1, 2, 3, Apollo 1, 2, 3. So let's go back to uh, this login page component HTML. So our username is, should be bound to username, and that should be bound to user password. All right, let's go back to here. Um, but we're using an observable pattern here. It's doing a subscribe, uh, and I'm just calling this login success or on login success if it's successful. If there's an error, then it's probably a username password is incorrect. Uh, and then we're using bind this because um, it doesn't do well when I sort of invoke a function outside of you know outside of a certain expression. I, for, I don't remember the dynamic declaration of functions that this works fine, but use bind this to make sure that when when this uh, subscribe completes an Angular calls this function that it's that this is referencing this, which is referencing the instance of this component. Uh, so let's take a look at login, and that's where we're making the API call. Uh, so login, you can have a URL. This is not the best way to obviously organize this code. You don't want to put like hard-coded strings. Probably need at least the root of this API URL somewhere else. Um, I guess it's okay to have prod slash authentic, or not even prod, but authenticate as a string within here. But probably the root of this should be should go somewhere else. Anyway. Uh, so login, it just invokes uh, an HTTP post. It's going to return stuff. Uh, let's see, post map response. Uh, this is going to return something back from uh, our authenticate API gateway, but it's going to return the token for this username and password. And we're going to use that in our subsequent calls. Uh, and then just as a, uh, a helpful, some we're storing it in local storage. I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but for now, I think it's OK. But local storage means it's stored in the browser, but not as cookies. Um, it's an area for this particular user. But we're, we're saving our token into this local storage. Uh, so when we go in, let's take a look at one of the pages, which is the to-do page, which is going to have uh, the list of to-do items. Um, we determine if it's login. Again, the login service is injected into this component. And we can check to see if the token exists locally or not. It's probably not the best way because it's, it's going to expire at some point. And you don't have a mechanism, or this doesn't have a mechanism to check to see what the expiration is or whether to re log in or not. Um, but for now, it's good enough. It works. Um, so we're going to go in when it's first initialized. 
we're going to uh, invoke on refresh, which can be invoked by the button as well. So on refresh, it's going to invoke this to do service, uh, get items, and I think to do service is aware of the token. So let's see, go to definition. Uh, to do service is using the login service. So this same login service is instantiated at the module level. Uh, so any children of the module uh, is going to uh, use the same login service unless you sort of you know go in here and do a different declaration in your component uh, in your component level and do some other uh, you can declare your own request your own instance of uh, the login service, but we're using the one. So what it's going to do, the most important part here is when it creates these requests, it's going to uh, set the authentic the authorization um, from the set the authorization header using the authentication uh, token that we got back from our login service. Uh, and then it does get items, uh, get URL map, join, and return um, it's it's con it's getting the result back and converting it to JSON and then returning that uh, to whatever's calling that service, that method on that service. So on refresh, it does get items, subscribe. It's going to get, uh, get the get item success, and the result is already converted to JSON. So we get the uh, items from our web API, or, uh, API gateway API Lambda call and uh, update uh, this dot items, and it just the this dot items. We just go through and do an ng4 iterate through the item of items and map the different fields in there. And we create this router link if we wanted to edit the individual items. So that's the basics of the Angular client. There's a lot of bootstrap. There's a lot of other things in there. And it's a lot to go through. But the basics is you've got an Angular client uh, that's going to log in. You get a token back. Uh, and then you're going to use that token in subsequent calls because all of your um, web APIs that are not this authenticate um, REST service um, is secured using our Cognito um, user pool. All right, so the one of the other pieces that we need is we need to serve up our client files. And it, for that, we need uh, somewhere to store those files. But before we do that, let's take a look at how we could possibly deploy. Uh, so if you look at package JSON on that Angular to-do um, project, package JSON, uh, we have the typical ng build. And this dash dash base href tells us what the root of the um, that deployed package is. If we didn't put this slash to do, then it would try to go to bleepingbots.com. If we leave, you know, the routing will try to go to bleepingbots.com as the home page. And we don't want that. We want bleepingbots.com slash to do when we hit the home page. Um, otherwise, it will just mess it up and you couldn't deploy more than one Angular app if you didn't set the base ref. Um, so this helps out the writing, the routing, and then you have to do this dash dash deploy dash URL slash do as well. Uh, so the ng build will get you local build of uh, you know webpack all of your different source files and put them in this disk file and also webpack all of your node modules that you need to run your Angular client app. But in order to get it to, um, or you want an easy way to take all of your distribution files 
and sort of move it up there. You can go and manually copy that whole folder into S3. And, we'll get, and here's the S3, by the way. Um, you can create an S3, map it to a, uh, a domain, uh, and use route, you, you can route, use route 53 for that. But once you go into your Bitbucket, it's just a folder structure. You create folders. Here's my to-do folder. Uh, and then you can copy and paste. You can upload those files. Now drag it from Finder. Let's see, where is it? To do, uh, take your this uh, files that was generated by your ng build and just upload it through here. Very manual. Works okay, I guess, but you don't want to be doing that all the time. So you can create another script and do an S3 push and um, do AWS. It's another uh, client or command line interface for it, and it's AWS, but you can invoke an S3 and it, this does a copy to or copy this folder disk slash which is everything under there um, and then the resource S3 your na name of your bucket and the folder and dash dash recursive means get all files get all folders underneath that so for deployment it's pretty straightforward uh, for continuous integration, you know, again, you have to set that up using code deploy. Um, but if you have a small app, the really, really quick way to just put that stuff out there. Um, so that's S3. Integrate an S3 bucket. Go to S3. Create bucket. Boom, you're done. Right? Enter your, if you're mapping it to a, um, a particular domain name you want to enter your domain name which is for me is leaping bots uh, and then obviously pick your regions etc and set properties probably don't want to make it public huh Shh. okay let's see what else we have and that's pretty much it on sort of deploying your angular app out there so now we have our uh, leaping bots our s3 that that has our angular static files that calls our to do API gateway uh, API resource and methods that's secured by cognito um, that calls uh, our lambda function and that calls mongodb so the only other thing is really this uh, route 53 which is again it's pretty straightforward um, go to route 53 management I'm probably going to sort of um, uh, mask this information. I don't know how much of this is sort of um, secure or not, or should be secured or not. But you go in and you can create um, hosted zones, or you can create hosted zones and um, add a domain. Uh, and then in here you can add an alias that maps uh, your um, S3 to this particular uh, domain name. So that is pretty straightforward as well. Let me click on this and you can see sort of all the information here. The type is uh, alias IP, IPv4 address and then alias target is I think this is the same regardless of the name of your uh, site and then I don't remember where that came from but there's tutorials out there on how to set up s3 or how to route a domain name to an s3 uh, bit bucket bucket not bit bucket an s3 bucket sorry and I think that sort of um, wraps it up. Um, you've got your Route 53 uh, that routes domain traffic to your S3, which serves up the static uh, the static files that you need to run your Angular client on your web browser. Uh, and then it again it goes through and calls API Gateway, which is secured by Cognito. These methods are mapped to or invoke lambda functions. So lambda functions invoke MongoDB. 
uh, and then these other lambdas are used to actually do authentication via um, the uh, API gateway and uh, Cognito when you register somebody it automatically triggers and sets the confirmed users so you don't have to do any type of manual uh, confirmation yourself so it's pretty straightforward I think that Terraform would help out a lot in setting up a lot of your pieces and it just be you know almost one line command to set everything up uh, the deploy piece is you know for a small app it's pretty straightforward to do it yourself but you want to automate that using code deploy some of the services that AWS has um, I guess the other question is you know do I want to go serverless uh, for me the consideration for that is um, the one question I ask myself is why do I need a Linux server to run any part of my app is any part of my app using any operation uh, OS specific functionality whether it's you know native API calls am I using their file system am I using inner process communication am I using commands from that OS um, and if the answer is no right if the only thing you're using is hey I've got a call from the client that says I need to get a list of things and you're just talking to Mongo directly um, and you're not doing anything that's OS specific then this is you know I would probably start with uh, Lambda function API gateway for your um, your compute your active components within uh, your application um, if you're doing mean stack if you think about it you've got Mongo Express Angular Node um, the Express and Node part um, just provide ser uh, serving up static files which you can do with S3 uh, and using this routing uh, routing your domain name or subdomain name to S3 uh, and then Express and Node also provide you with these RESTful services which the API gateway can provide you and the uh, Lambda can provide I guess the API gateway provides you the routing uh, to your Lambda functions to the appropriate code uh, and then your Lambda provides your active component or your reactive component that will give you the data update data delete data etc so none of this you know most applications um, don't use the services of an operating system they're really just there to run processes uh, and not that much more in today's uh, world there there are instances where you're going to use operating uh, system or op OS operating system specific services and functionality but for the most part in today's modular uh, distributed um, systems and applications it's really not there um, so if I were to start a brand new app for a for a mobile phone or any type of functionality that requires saving data getting data initiating you know some type of activity some type of action I would definitely recommend starting with this type of structure where there's really no server that's running you just got a bunch of AWS components that you're sort of uh, hooking together and make sure uh, that they play well together so that's it. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. If, or if you have any questions, just leave it in the comments. Thank you.